Welcome to Brain Matters webinar series. Entering its third and final phase, the Human Brain Project has launched Brain Matters, which is a webinar series exploring the various issues being tackled by the HPT scientific community. So these hour-long sessions focus on different areas of brain research and feature expert speakers with the goal of highlighting the HPT scientific achievements and the state-of-the-art services offered by its infrastructure for brain research for eBrains. So my name is Trygve Lerbord. Uh, I am a professor of neuroanatomy and neuroinformatics at the University of Oslo in Norway. And I will moderate the 12th edition of Brain Matters entitled Rodent Brain Atlasing. The webinar features the Human Brain Project researchers Heidi Kleben, Maya Pushades, and Ingrid Bjerke who are all from the Neurosystems Laboratory at the University of Oslo. So thank you for participating tonight. Our three speakers will each have a 10 minute session together forming a continuous half hour session. Feel free to write your questions using the Q&A section of Zoom and we will answer it at the end of the webinar. Please also mention the name of the speaker to whom your question is directed. And finally, please note that the chat will not be read, only the Q&A section. But before our three speakers begin, I will say a few words about the background for the topic of this Brain Matters session. The brain is the most complex structure we know, and experimental data are collected with different methods at multiple scales. But despite many decades of research investment, we remain far from our goal of understanding brain structure and function to an extent that allows us to identify effective treatments for brain disease, which are a major burden for society. So increasing amounts of research data are produced, but lack of reproducibility remains a major challenge. It is now widely recognized that we need to gather data in a different way. We need to openly share data in a way that allows researchers to find and access and integrate and reuse these data. And there is a need to integrate data. So to address these challenges, eBrains has, or the Human Brain Project, has created the eBrains research infrastructure, which uses open access brain atlases to facilitate integration and more efficient analysis of data. So brain atlases are important tools that are not only used to plan experiments, assign location to brain experimental data, to learn about the brain, but as we will see in this webinar, Atlases also open new possibilities for data integration and for developing more and better tools that allow efficient analysis of brain data. So if we then switch to the first speaker, who will be Heidi Kleven. Please, Heidi, can you share your screen? <clears throat> so Heidi Kleven uh, is a PhD student at the University of Oslo, and she will now present some of her PhD work on developing and expanding 3D digital brain atlases for the rat and the mouse brain. Please, Heidi, go ahead. Hi, my name is Heidi, and I will tell you about the rat and mouse brain atlases used and developed by eBrains. First, I'll briefly introduce brain atlases. So what is a brain atlas and what information do we need about atlases to use them in computational tools? To find this out, we looked at a series of atlases and here you can see a typical page from a fictional atlas and one way of finding specific locations. In all of the atlases we looked at, we found that all of them had four common elements, a reference image, coordinate system, annotated brain regions, and names. And these are all connected to each other. This gives us the Atlas ontology model, which is a model that we use as a basis for identifying the information that we need to use atlases in tools. 
The first brain atlas I want to talk about is the Vaxon Space Atlas of the Sprague Dolly Rat Brain. So using Atom, we can quickly find the important information. So this atlas is based on a high resolution magnetic resonance imaging, MRI, of a single male Sprague Dolly Rat. The coordinate system is called the Vaxon Space after Vaxon in Stockholm, Sweden, where it was invented and is based on internal landmark, similar to what we have in the Talrich Atlas for human. This is what all the brain structure annotations look like, and I'll come back to these shortly. And the terminology is hierarchical, meaning that each structure is organized based on a system. In this case, it's organized based on the five secondary vesicles of the embryonic brain. So this rat brain atlas has been incorporated in the eBrain's infrastructure, and more than 100 data sets are registered to the atlas. This means that if I choose the brain structure, such as the CA1 in the hippocampus, I can see shared data that has been collected in CA1. I will come back to this a bit later. The Maxon Space Rat Brain Atlas has more than 200 brain structures, such as the auditory system, basal ganglia, cortex, the hippocampal region, and thalamus. All the brain structures in the Vaxon Rat Brain Atlas has been manually delineated. And when it's difficult to see a border, we use additional data, such as cyto, myelo, or chemo architecture, electrophysiology, or literature to find specific details. And we also talk to expert anatomists to verify the borders. Each structure has a set of specific metadata, such as a unique ID, a color code, a name, and hierarchical position. So here are some of the newest brain structures that we have delineated. These are the cortical structures. Thalamic structures. And the striatopalatal and midbrain dopaminergic structures. I mentioned I would come back to the hierarchy and that is because this is an extremely useful way of working with an atlas. The hierarchy help give context to where you are in the brain, and it also allows dynamic use of the atlas in tools and visualizing or analyzing across brain regions and systems, such as the hippocampal region. So you can either isolate structures, regions, or systems that you want to look at, or you can combine areas. I also want to show you that in this specific viewer, the mesh view, you can also cut these brain regions and have a look at what they look like in a plane or at a different angle. As this rat brain atlas is incorporated in the eBrain's infrastructure, that means that it is also possible to use the brain structure to find data collected in that specific area. So you can look at the hierarchy, search for a structure such as the CA1, you can choose this structure and look at regional features. Here you get the list of data. And if you choose the first one on this list, you get a bit more information about what we will find here. And you can then click on the eBrains data set and you will be transported to the data card where you'll get an overview of the data, a data descriptor that says something about what you'll find, how to cite it, how to get the data, associated publications and more information such as specimen and metadata. Next, I wanted to briefly mention the Allen Mouse Brain Atlas, specifically the Allen Mouse Brain Atlas Common Coordinate Framework version 3 from 2017. Here we can also use Atom to quickly find the important information. So this atlas is based on a population average of 1,675 mice. The coordinate system is the common coordinate framework. This is what all of the brain structure annotation looks like. And as with the rat brain atlas, the terminology is hierarchical. This mouse brain atlas has also been incorporated in the eBrains infrastructure and have more than 200 data sets registered and available through the eBrains portal. There are 673 brain structures in the atlas, such as cortical regions, thalamic regions, basal ganglia regions, and hippocampal formation regions. And all these structures can be used in the same way as I showed for the rat brain atlas. So again, you can choose a region and find data. Here again, field CA1. And as the mouse and rat brain atlas are made up of the same elements, 
this allows us to compare them. So if you focus on the hippocampal formation, which is called hippocampal region in rat, we can see that they are similar. If you now have the same color scheme, it's easier to compare them. And Ingmo will show you an example analysis of this later. Lastly, I want to show you our most recent work, which is the developmental mouse brain analysis. We are working with four developmental stages, P9, meaning postnatal day nine, P14, P21, and P28. This atlas, these atlases are also population averages, as we saw with the owl mouse brain atlas, and they have one other striking similarity, the same annotation set as the adult mouse atlas. So we are aiming to create developmental atlases with annotations that are comparable to adult mouse, allowing analysis across young and adult animals. This will also allow us to get a better understanding of how the brain develops and visualize the differences between the developing and the adult brain. And we will mention this later as well. So this is where you can find more information about the Vaxon Rat Brain Atlas, as well and at the eBrains Atlas servers, which has Rat Brain Atlas, the Mouse Brain Atlas, the Multi-Level Human Brain Atlas, and the Macaque Brain Atlas. So I would now like to acknowledge the current Atlas development team, the Atlas development contributors, and our collaborators. Thank you. Thank you. Now we will move on to Maya Pujadis, who is a senior researcher in the Neural Systems Laboratory, who will give an overview of the uh, tools and pipelines that we have available via the ERANS infrastructures. So, so Maya will talk about tools and pipelines that are used to analyzing broken brain images using the 3D open atlases that Heidi just talked about that then are employed to define anatomical location. So please, Maya, go ahead. Thank you very much, uh, Trigger, for this nice introduction. And uh, I will now present the eBrain tools and uh, analy analytical workflows. Um, Yes. So in the eBrains infrastructure, um, as uh, my colleague Heidi already um, showed you, you can find the data set, but you can also find models. And uh, we have uh, rich metadata that is organized in the knowledge graph. And we have uh, references atlases, as well as uh, different services. And within the Atlas services, uh, we share tools that are uh, used for spatial analysis. And I will also um, present some of the dedicated uh, workflow for specific use cases. So to start um, in the Brain Atlas service page on ebrains.eu, uh, you will find tools for um, registration of your histological experimental images. Those tools are called QuickNe and VisualLion. And uh, they are very handy when you have an experimental sections uh, like shown here in A, uh, where you, you want to see uh, where it fits in the atlas. It could be uh, that it's right in between two planches. But in those tools, you can modify the 3D atlas to uh, adapt and find the exact location of your section. So I have a small video to show you this. Uh, in the QuickMe tool, you see you can um, uh, manipulate the 3D atlas by stretching it in different dimensions. Uh, the QuickMe user interface allow you to um, switch between different uh, data modalities. You can choose MRI, DTI, or um, choose to visualize the meshes. Uh, you will have your experimental section and the atlas on top of it in the main window, but also three small windows showing the other planes. 
so you can orient yourself during this registration process. And you also have uh, on the right hand side uh, an overview of your sections. So Quickney is compatible with any cutting angle, and we have developed um, many user manuals. And we also have uh, tutorial videos that are shared on the INCF training space. Uh, we are happy to uh, have a growing user community, and uh, we are also soon going to share um, an online version of uh, Quickney on the eBrains Collaboratory. Uh, as Quickney is performing uh, a linear registration, you might want to refine your registration, and for doing this, you can use our tool Visualine. Um, as shown here in this small video, you can place um, markers on specific landmarks and then stretch the atlas in place. By doing so, um, you will refine um, the registration that you already have obtained, either using Quickney or DeepSlice tool, which is a machine learning based automatic registration tool. Here also we have uh, prepared uh, friendly tutorials. And what is very important is that both Quickney and Visualine are compatible with the other tools uh, inside the Quid workflow, but I will come back to that in a minute. Uh, on the eBrains infrastructure, you will also find uh, different viewers that are linked to data set. Uh, one of them is a new viewer where you can visualize high resolution image um, in a film strip mode or in a collection mode. And we also have the locally zoom viewer um, where you will see uh, the result of your anchoring, but you can also perform some point annotation that can be extracted. So you have this dual possibility to view with or without uh, the registration. Uh, in localizum, you will be able to see the brain name when you hover the mouse over the brain region and uh, extract uh, coordinates of those uh, annotations. Localizum is also compatible with the other tools in the pipeline, uh, Quickly Visual Line, uh, Mesh View, and Little. Um, we, as Heidi showed you uh, briefly, uh, we also have a mesh view, which uh, allows you to visualize the Atlas meshes, uh, and they are toggleable in uh, opaque, transparent, or hidden uh, mode. And when the, the meshes are rendered as solid objects, you can cut them. And this viewer is available uh, for different Atlas versions uh, as well in the mouse and in the right. What is also possible to do with MeshView is to render point clouds uh, as shown in the small video here. Um, and this is um, also something we are, you will see in the Quint workflow, which is generating such point clouds. And uh, this tool is also available uh, on the eBrains collaboratory. So um, I wanted to give you some examples of what you can do uh, using a locally zoom. For example, um, my colleagues, uh, Professor Lerger and Studer, um, used the locally zoom to annotate the, the cortical pontin projections. And uh, they, uh, by doing so, were able to show that in the NR2F1 knockout mouse, they had increased connection from the cortex to the pulse as compared to wild type animals. Uh, other researchers also uh, that shared uh, data on the eBrains infrastructure uh, have used locally zoom to map uh, the projection from the orbital from the cortex in rats. And uh, they shown and were able to um, produce this uh, connectivity matrix showing the connectivity within, within different regions in, in the lab. But uh, I talked a little bit uh, about the print workflow, so I will give you some more insights now. Uh, the 
Gridworkflow is a suite of tools allowing you to quantify uh, using the Atlas different features in your histological images. So typically you start with uh, labeled image sections, uh, do a registration to Atlas with Quickening and Visual Line, obtain segmentation with a uh, segmentation tool like Elastic, and then you use the Util Quantifier tool in order to extract uh, point clouds and reports of distribution of cells or other features. In the collaboratory, you will also find how to download the softwares and uh, tutorials, uh, as well as um, links to uh, support by SGST and contact with that with via GitHub repositories. Um, the Nutrient software has a very uh, user-friendly graphical user interface and has different uh, modalities. Uh, one modality allows you to uh, do pre-processing of your files, like rotating or uh, rename them. Um, and then there is this quantifier feature that allows you to perform spatial object analysis. Uh, this is possible to do both in rat and mouse. And here also you have manuals. The results um, are shown uh, as um, um, extensive reports and also point clouds. And uh, my colleague Ingvil will in a moment show you a study she uh, performed using the Quint workflow to look at parallel and Calvinian neurons. So I would like to invite you to our user community. Uh, we get a lot of feedback from our users and uh, they help us to uh, improve our tools and uh, also to um, consider new features that are needed uh, for doing uh, Atlas-based analysis. In summary, um, you can for image registration using Quickly and Visualign. You will find them under the Atlas services on emrace.eu. Atlas-based quantification of uh, cells or other label features are done with a util software accessible to metric. Uh, you will find uh, LocaliZoom and MioViewer um, attached on dedicated data sets on the knowledge graph but also they are uh, available in a personalized workspace. And uh, in the collaboratory, you will uh, be able to find online version of all these tools. So I now would like to thank uh, my collaborators in uh, the Neural System Laboratory. And thank you for your attention. So thank you, Maya. This was very nice. Uh, we will now move on to the final session of this webinar uh, with um, Ingvil Gerke, who is a postdoc in the Neural Systems Laboratory. And Ingvil will present some of her experimental work in the world of brain, where she made use of eBrain's atlases and the tools to determine the amount of the amount and distribution of specific cells that express calcium binding proteins across the entire rat and mouse brain. So please, Ingrid, go ahead. Thank you for the introduction, Trivin. So as you said, I will give a practical example here on how you can use eBrain's tools and atlases by telling you about a quantitative analysis that we did of calbindin and pervalbinin neurons across the rat and mouse brain. So to summarize a bit what my colleagues have discussed, we have seen that 3D brain atlases allow you to find planes that exactly matches your sections, cut the atlas in any orientation, which in sum allows you to more precisely localize your data compared to what could be achieved with a traditional 2D atlas. And if you use tools for spatial registration, like Maya talked about, this also gives you metadata about the registration that you can store and share together with images from your study. And this is also a great way of organizing and documenting your work to make it easier for yourself and possibly others as well 
to interpret and reuse the data later. So I wanna emphasize that registration of your data to 3D reference atlases can facilitate a range of things uh, like data integration, but you'll also have opportunities for more efficient analysis as well as better ways to share and reuse your data. But in this talk, I'll focus on this part with more efficient analysis data. So what I've been focusing a lot on in my research is to use 3D brain atlases in general and the Quint workflow in particular to quantify neurons across the brain. And counting neurons has been of interest for researchers for a century, but has traditionally been very labor intensive. So the oldest way to do cell counting was simply to count whatever you could see in the tissue, um, what we can call manual counts. And this can obviously only be done for very small regions. And what you typically see in the literatures is that researchers will draw a circle or a box of a known size onto their sections and then count the number of cells within that known area. But later on, uh, the stereological method was introduced. And <clears throat> here you select systematic random samples throughout the region of interest, so-called counting frames, and count anything that falls within these. And counts are then extrapolated for the full region. So this means that you can sample larger areas than you could by counting everything manually, but it's still quite time consuming as the regions of interest have to be drawn by hand and counts within the counting frames still has to be done manually. So due to the tedious nature of these traditional methods, there's been a lot of interest for automating the task of extracting cells from images. And we can term methods to do so collectively as uh, segmentation-based methods. So over the past decade, there has been significant advances in these automatic methods, in particular in machine learning-based methods, so that there's now potential for very accurate automatic segmentation. And combined with definitions of regions of interest based on atlas registration, these methods can fundamentally change the scale of cell counting efforts. So uh, going forwards in the talk, I wanna show you an example use case of what we can do with these more automated approaches to counting cells. And I'm gonna focus on a study we did to elucidate the relative numbers and distributions of pravaldamine and calbindin neurons within and across regions and species. And we here had data from both rat and mouse brains and we use DAB immunohistochemistry to visualize the calbindin and pravaldamine positive cells. And we then registered all of these section images to reference atlases using Quickney and Visualine. And shown here are the mouse brain sections, which were registered to the Allen mouse brain atlas. But we also use the Vaxon space atlas for the rat data. And we then used a tool called Elastic to perform image segmentation. And Elastic is a machine learning based tool that basically allows you to teach the computer to recognize the features you're interested in. And it's very convenient as you can interactively view the results as you go and you can keep training until you're satisfied with uh, what it extracts. So here you can see some examples from our extraction of calbindin and provalbumin cells. And so once we have these atlas maps and the segmentation images, we then can quantify and visualize all the segmented cells using NUTIL, which gives us these visualizations where each extracted neuron is color-coded according to the brain regions. And we lastly post-process the quantitative data from NUTIL and created uh, these types of bar graphs that you see at the bottom of the figure, where every bar represents a brain region in the atlas. So I'll present some of the results from our analysis of these numbers. Uh, we did a cross-species comparison of the hippocampal region in mouse and rat. And to do this, uh, we first had to assess which region corresponded among the two atlases used for the rat and mouse. So this is what Heidi showed briefly earlier. 
So here in this figure, the owl mouse brain atlas regions are combined and color coded according to their corresponding region in the vaxone space atlas. And this type of combination of structures into custom regions is a feature that you can use in NUTIL. So we found many similarities in the two species. As we can see here, the numbers differ, but the trends uh, are very similar across the difference of regions of the hippocampus and parahippocampus. And generally, we find uh, higher prolonged neuron densities in mice than in rats. We also looked into the distribution of the provolumin cells uh, from dorsal to ventral in all of the parahippocampal regions. And we found that in both species, the density of provolumin neurons decreased from dorsal to ventral in both the lateral and the medial entorhinal cortex, but not in any of the other regions. We also compared the distribution of parvalbumin and calvinin neurons in the mouse brain. And here in this, uh, these bar graphs, the total neuron number for each type in the different regions of the brain are plotted and color-coded according to the region color in the Allen mouse brain atlas. So again, every bar here is um, a region or rather a custom region, which is a combination of uh, the very fine subregions of the Allen mouse brain atlas. And as can be seen from comparing these diagrams, the patterns of distribution seem to be quite complementary, so that provolumin neuron numbers were high in areas where cobinding numbers were low, and vice versa. And we saw that provolumin neurons were most common in the sensory and motor vortices, the parahippocampal regions as well as in the brainstem and medulla, whereas calbinin neurons were most common in olfactory regions, in amygdalar areas, in the striatum and the pallidum, as well as in the thalamus and hypothalamus. And these trends fit well with the functional roles of these neuron types in different regions and systems. So to give you an outlook on what we want to do next, uh, we know that provolumin and cobinin neurons are abundant in the brain, and they also have been implicated in a range of neurodevelopmental disorder. Uh, but there is a big gap in our knowledge of the developing brain, as most studies are performed on adults, and good resources such as atlases for developing brains has typically been lacking. But with the developmental atlases that Heidi mentioned and related tools for spatial registration and analysis, we're now equipped to map cells and perform comparative analysis across development far more efficiently and accurately than has been possible previously. So during my postdoc, I started a project to collect data showing pervalbumin and calbindin across four postnatal stages from infancy and through adolescence. And in collaboration with two master students, we have gathered a brain-wide data collection uh, showing these neurons and registered all the data to age-matched reference atlases. And the next uh, step in this project is to finalize a full quint analysis of the data. So to summarize, I hope that I've convinced you that there are some significant advantages of mapping your data to 3D atlases. And in particular, that it allows for more efficient analysis, which in turn allows us to increase the scope of our studies. And I'd also like to mention that one particular advantage of using the 3D atlases is that they allow seamless transition between versions because the template brain used to create the brain atlas stays the same you can use your data with any new version of the atlas. So for example, in the analysis of cobinin and provolumin neurons that I uh, talked about, we used version two of the vaccine atlas. But now that the new version four is out, it's very simple to rerun all of the analysis with a new atlas version, which is shown for one example brain here. 
And you can see already that it gives us much more detail about the distribution of these neurons in the brain. And lastly, I'd like to emphasize that there's many use cases for the point workflow beyond just cell counting. And we know that the workflow has been used to map many different features, such as axonal terminals, microemboli, and Alzheimer's plaques. And then lastly, to just summarize some resources for you, if you want to read more about using the QUINT workflow for cell counting, you can see our publication in iScience from last year. You can also find a lot of documentation on the QUINT workflow on the, this eBrains collab, and you can always get user support uh, in the eBrains system. And lastly, I'd like to acknowledge all of the people who contributed to these projects, uh, in particular, everyone who helped with the analysis and development of the tools. Thank you. So thank you all. So great thanks to the three speakers tonight. Um, we have now concluded the three presentations of the webinar and we will move on to the Q, the question and answers session. So um, you can post your questions in the Q&A uh, tab down in the Zoom window. Place your questions there. And uh, please also specify to whom in the panel that you address your question, and then we will take them successively. We have already a few questions, and uh, I would like to start with the first one, which will be addressed to Heidi. So um, this question says, nice presentation, but is there any part of the mouse brain you haven't yet included in the mouse atlas? Decided. Well, first, thank you. Um, so the uh, the mouse atlas that we use is the one that is created by the Allen Institute, and they've done an amazing job with six hundred and seven more than six hundred and fifty brain regions. Um, I cannot tell you specifically that a specific region has not been delineated, but I do know that there are areas that are not as detailed as others. So for instance, the cortex has delineations that goes all the way down to cell layers. And so, but there are also areas that are these sort of like unknown sort of um, in between areas where we're not quite sure what lies there or if it's a transition area. So there are definitely work that can be done. Thank you. We have another question also related to the atlases and it goes to Heidi. And the question is, will there be information on which features were used to delineate each region? So I assume this is for the Vaxon Rat Brain Atlas. Um, and yes, this is something that we take a big pride in, in the Neural Systems Laboratory, that when we publish something on a brain region, we also publish the delineation criteria that lies behind it. So in most cases, we try to use the signal intensity in the reference data from the MRI. But when that's not possible, we use site architecture or the white matter or literature or experts. And these decisions are always published um, with um, the publication on the version that comes out. So we are working on that right now. So that will hopefully be available early next year. Thank you. We do have a third question also about the atlases. So we will uh, sort of move that one to Heidi. And it goes, are there whole brain developmental rat templates slash atlases in development? From our group, not currently. Um, we know how to do it. So it's possible to do it, but we are not working on it currently. So if anyone wants to do this, I would um, recommend that you contact us and we might have a talk, but we're not working on it right now. Thank you. Then we move on. Um, there is a question uh, that I guess can go to Maya. Are all the data sets shown uh, in the talk public, uh, publicly available? For example, Condo et al. Uh, so um, uh, some data sets are um, on the embargo, 
uh, because some of the data set producers want to publish their publication before uh, making the, all the data available. So I think it is the case for this one. Uh, but as soon as the publication is out, the embargo is lifted and the data is made available. Thank you. So, but I, I guess that from the presentation that most of the data are actually possible to look up in the eBrains uh, data services. So one can go to eBrains.eu, go to data services, find data, and for example, type in condo and actually find that those data are indeed available. Okay, we will move on to the next question. Um, it goes to Maya. Is access to the tool, to the analysis, analysis tools open for everyone? Yes, indeed. Uh, anyone can uh, access the analysis tool on ebrains.eu. Uh, you will have uh, instruction on where to find and download the tools. Um, uh, and as I said, also, we are preparing online tools and those will be accessible through, uh, through an eBrain um, account. So you just have to sign up, have a green eBrain account, and then you can access uh, the tools and the infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. We have one more Atlas-related question. Um, can I add my own brain structures to the rat brain Atlas? And I think perhaps this question should go to Heidi. Yes. Um, yes, in the sense that the Maxim Rat Brain Atlas is open source and available. So anyone can download it and also download the tool that we use to delineate structures, which is the ITK Snap. And you can make whatever structure you feel like. And we're also working on uh, trying to make a pipeline for people to test regions so that we can see if we can make a solution for custom brain atlases where you have these specific areas that you work on. This is still in the works, but yes, everyone can download the atlas and create new regions if you want to. And you can also contact eBrain supports if you want to have more information about what to do or any help. Okay, thank you. Then we have a question for Ingvi. Is this type of study possible to perform without any coding skills? Uh, I would definitely say yes. Uh, at the time when uh, we did the study, I did not know <clears throat> anything uh, about coding. So uh, it's very, very possible. I would say if you have large data set with lots and lots of samples, it helps to have some basics coding skills, but you definitely, all the tools have a graphical user interface and uh, you can get a very long way with uh, with Excel and uh, <laughs> yeah. Okay, good. So there is a, a follow-up question that might go to both Heidi and uh, Ingrid, but the question goes, how easy is it to break down Provalbovin and Calvindin densities into layers, for example, in the hippocampus? I can maybe start. Um, I would say the main limitation there is that as far as I know, the uh, 3D, the LMAS brain common coordinate framework, the most recent version doesn't um, separate the layers of the campus, except in the dented gyrus, they do, I think. But for the corner monis, they don't have the individual layers in the atlas. So, there, then you essentially have two options. You could modify the atlas itself and create your own version of the atlas, uh, which I suppose is a bit complex, or you might use some more uh, manual ways to delineate the regions. But I suppose the layers would be possible to, to recognize in these stains, and Heidi might maybe say something about that. Yeah, so I, I completely agree. Um, this is a perfect example where you can delineate yourself and actually get the layers. Uh, in the hippocampus, these are easier to see than most. They're quite distinct. 
And there's also a lot of great uh, reference material at, out at eBrains, like the Tim Tunin reference data that is very helpful for recognizing the layers in the hippocampus, but it would require you to go in and make these modifications. But it is possible, so it might be worth the effort. But the conclusion, as I understand the two of you, is that in order to have granular analysis, it really depends on which structures are available for the reference atlases that are used. And they are, of course, possible to modify, but it's not a trivial task. So we have another question which is related to this, uh, addressed to, uh, to Ingvig. Uh, did you compare other regions in the rat and mouse brain than the hippocampal region? Uh, in our publication uh, in iScience, we did not, uh, and that was mainly because at the time we used the uh, second version of the Waxham Atlas, where the most detailed delineations were in the hippocampus, and uh, most other regions were quite coarsely delineated. Uh, now that version four is out, as I mentioned, we can we can update these analyses, uh, which we have uh, piloted for one one of the data sets and seeing that it's quite straightforward. So that is definitely something that would be interesting to do. And then we could look into the more um, finely delineated structures in version four, such as the thalamus uh, and the uh, basal ganglia regions that Heidi showed. So the advantage of, 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 of this is that since the data are all registered to the same template, it is possible to do more refined analysis at the later stage once the atlas gets updated. Okay, thank you. Then um, also to Ingvild, uh, can the method be used to quantify neurons uh, seen using nissel stains or uh, HME stains? Um, I haven't seen anyone doing exactly that, uh, but in principle, the, the quint workflow uh, can be used for anything where you can recognize the signal from the background. So if you can recognize it, you can generally teach uh, the machine also to recognize it. Um, I do think maybe nissel stain sections might be tricky. Uh, as I know them, that it, it's... It requires quite a uh, trained neuroanatomist to spot differences between the different cell types. So I would maybe um, recommend using um, antibodies such as uh, Noyan or something more uh, that's more uh, easily distinguished from the, the background. But it would be very interesting to see uh, efforts to do this in nissel stain. I haven't seen any uh, so far myself. Okay, thank you. Uh, do you have any additional comments to this, Maya? Because I guess the, I guess the question really points to what is possible to 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 filter out using the machine learning uh, tools in the background. Exactly. So there are two aspects. So one aspect is uh, the image registration to the atlas. So that can be any image, and there the limitation is. Uh, that if you see any landmarks or not. So if the staining you're using um, is very pale and then you don't really distinguish so much uh, any landmarks, you could lose a bit of precision. But usually we use white matter landmarks and the hippocampus allows us to, in most stain, recognize where we are in the brain. And we haven't been using it also for fluorescence data, so it is possible. The other aspect is the segmentation, of course, and here um, there are some limitations, but there are many uh, image segmentation software or scripts. So depending on which kind of image you have, you'll have to test a bit uh, and see where which software could provide you with the best segmentation that is uh, suitable and the only um, requirement for using the quint workflow is then that you can have your segmentation exported as a uh, red, blue, green, and blue PNG images. Okay. Thank you. Let us move on. And um, this question goes to Heidi. It's about atlases. Do you have a similar tool for more up to date atlases such as Sigma? 
So I'm not quite sure what tool is referred to, but if uh, it's an alternative to ITK Snap, which is the one that we've used to create the Vatson Rapid Atlas, there is one alternative one that I've seen in relation to atlases, which is the 3D slicer. I have not used this one, but I've had a quick look and it is also an open source and available tool. So that is what I would have gone to. Okay, thank you. And maybe we can also forward the question to, to Maya, because as I understand it, the question is, if you have another an alternative atlas, what does it take to incorporate this into the tools, the atlas registration tools or the analytic workflow? Yes, so currently uh, Quickney and Visualine have the Atlas embedded inside the tool, so it's not a plugin. So this will require some uh, to, to contact us and, and that will help you to, to create a version with uh, your favorite Atlas uh, embedded in, in the tool. That is fully possible. Okay, thank you. So to all in the audience, if you have any final questions, please post them in the Q&A uh, field. Uh, I have now a final question in the list here now, um, which is to, to all in the panel. And it goes, um, can I get help for my specific project? And what is HLST? I can perhaps answer the last part of the question, which is what is HLST? HLST is an, is an abbreviation for a high level support team of the Human Brain Project, which is a team that takes in questions and tries to, to, to pipe this to different parts of the project where the questions can be answered. And then perhaps, uh, I don't know who in the, in the panel here would like to answer the question, where where do people go to to get assistance for the specific projects? Maybe Maya. Yes, so you, you just send us an email um, at support at ebrain.au. You can also go to the web page and, and click and then you will see the support uh, button and you can uh, fill in the form, ask a question. Uh, you can also reach us through a range of GitHub projects uh, if you're more into the tools and programming. So there are multiple ways, and we also, as some of our tools are downloaded from, from nitrig.org, you can also go there and contact us there. So there, there are multiple channels. Okay, thank you. So then you know where to go to. I think we can conclude the webinar with this. So thank you all for attending the webinar. If you would like to see a replay of it, please join the Human Brain Project YouTube channel. Uh, and if you have questions, uh, you can contact the outreach at humanbrainproject.eu, uh, where uh, where all these uh, webinars are found. The next webinar will be on. Um, on December 13, um, and uh, I don't know if I have the title for that. It will be on neuroscience and high performance computing. So that will be on December 13 from 16.30 to 17.30 CET. So please join in for that webinar. Thank you for participating and have a good evening. Thank you. <laughs>